Hello everyone. In this video, we're actually going to start moving traffic through our Kubra Packet Master Series Network Packet Broker. And this video is going to be the first in a series of videos where we're really going to uh, explore the functionality that we have as far as filtering goes, things like protocol stripping, layer modification, load balancing. All of those things are, are going to be part of this video series. But to uh, achieve that, we first have to start at the very simple prospect of getting traffic from point A to point B. And that's what this video is about. We're going to be using the web GUI interface of the uh, Packet Master. And I'm going to be using the EX2 in this example, but this process is exactly the same for all of the Packet Masters. Um, this video series is also going to explore doing all of these functions in the command line as well. So we'll get to see how things perform in the web GUI and how we also achieve those those ends in a in the command line interface. So we log into our packet master. The first thing that we see in our web GUI is our rule table. And here mine is empty. Um, so we can start creating some rules. To do that, we're going to go to the add rule tab and we're going to bring up this page. Uh, this page has three main sections. We have main properties at the top, match fields on the lower left, and then actions on the lower right. I'm just briefly going to talk about these three sections and what is uh, contained within them, and then we'll get on to our, our examples. In main properties, uh, we have a few different things. The first two are, are kind of paired together in that they're in either or kind of situation. We have cookie, and then we have name. Uh, these are the ways that we're going to identify the rules as we create them. If we select cookie, what this is, is this gives us the opportunity to put in a unique numeric identifier for our rule. If we select name, then this is going to be the uh, descriptive name. It can be anything. And it also allows us to put in a description, which uh, could be an even more expansive commentary on anything that the user finds relevant to the rule when they're creating it, such as you know the purpose it serves, why it was created, the traffic it's handling, et cetera. It could be anything in there or nothing at all. Uh, so the question might arise at this point, well, why would we use some you know, numeric identifier that really doesn't mean anything to us uh, rather than a descriptive name. And the answer to that is more so that um, using cookies can be a little easier to work with if you're using the command line interface primarily. Uh, it can also be something that you might find is a little easier to work with if you're doing maybe some automated functions via the REST API, such as dynamically setting up and tearing down rules based on various triggers. You just might find as you're scripting a solution like that, that using the cookie to identify those rules is uh, easier, more straightforward method than adding a name and description. And I'll point out that even when we add a name and description, this does generate a cookie on the back end. Uh, the, the device just assigns a random cookie to that. Not a random cookie. I think it's sequential, actually, but it assigns a cookie to our rule as well. Um, the next field that we have here is priority. And there will be a separate video that really goes more in depth on priority and, and how it comes into play, especially when we're stacking rules to achieve a specific effect. The priority is a very important um, aspect of that. Uh, it's also a really important aspect of, of creating rules in general because a, a rule with a higher priority number is going to take precedence over rules with lower priority numbers. So uh, we'll discuss this more in the priority video, but just know that uh, the highest value, 65,535, uh, is the highest priority a rule can have. Higher, higher numbered rules take precedence over lower numbered rules. And by default, every rule, be, rule will be created with a value of 32,768 right there in the middle. Uh, but if you have two rules that sort of uh, they could both potentially match traffic. The higher priority rule is going to be the one to process that traffic, and thus the lower priority rule will never see that traffic. In the match fields category here, we have everything that really pertains to how we handle our ingress traffic. So this would be any kind of filtering, layer two, layer three, layer four. We can do things like TCP flags in here. There are some other kind of custom match stuff that we'll get into. Uh, and then, of course, our input ports. What ports are we actually bringing the traffic in from? Um, then actions is the other side of that. And this is really everything that has to do with the egress of our traffic. So anything as far as outputting that traffic, protocol stripping, header modification, 
things like that, that follows under the actions uh, box. So let's go ahead and start creating some examples of our rules here. And the first one is gonna be a pretty simple one, just unidirectional traffic flow. And this is simply taking traffic in one port, let's say port one in our example, and we're gonna output it to another port, let's say port six. Uh, real quick, I'll just hit the drop in the output to group here, touch on those, and then we won't have to talk about those for the rest of this video. Drop traffic, it does exactly what it, it sounds like. It, it says that anything in this case that would come in port one, we're simply gonna discard that. And you might ask, why, why would I create a rule such as this? And you, and realistically, you wouldn't. You wouldn't create a rule specifying a port just to drop that traffic. But where this really comes into play is when we start adding our filters in here so that you can take a specific subset of your traffic, maybe a specific subnet or things going to a particular destination IP that you don't want to be included in your output for one reason or another. This would give you the ability to single that out and drop that from the traffic feed. Output to group, paired with a valid group ID, this would be the option you would select if you were to output the traffic coming in, your input ports here, out to a port group that you have defined. Uh, again, port groups will be covered in another video. Everything from you know port replication or uh, traffic replication groups to fast failover to load balancing groups, we'll hit that all in another video. But when creating a rule and you want it to output to a port group, this is where that's gonna be found. And back to our output to ports. So we say in port one, out port six, apply that rule. And we get a cool little rule added successfully banner up here. When we go back to our rule table, we see our unidirectional rule in port one, output to port six. Very simple, right? Um, another very common example, a very common use case for network packet brokers is traffic aggregation. So taking multiple ports of traffic or multiple ingress ports and combining all of that traffic out to one output port. So let's create a aggregation rule here. And you'll commonly see this, uh, especially with network taps. Whenever we have a tap that is tapping a network link, uh, it's going to create two monitor outputs for every single link. You're gonna have one output for the RX side of the traffic and one output for the TX side of the traffic. It would be very common for us then to take those two independent uh, channels of traffic and combine them back together and output them to a single monitoring device. So let's say we have a tap connected to ports two and three of our EX2, and we want to output that to port five. And what I did over here real quick was I did a two comma three to specify uh, both of my ports. So using commas, we can separate port numbers and we can uh, selectively, uh, we can pick ports based on that criteria, non-consecutive ports. So, you know, I could add like port six in here as well, or I could add port four. Uh, another way that I could do this is with a dash. So if I did two dash three, that works just fine in this case. That's saying ports two through three or two and three. However, if I did something like ports two through five, that's ports two, three, four, and five versus two comma five would be ports two and five. So let's just do our original two and three, output to five, apply that rule. And we'll see we now have our aggregation rule here, taking the port or traffic from ports two and three, combining that and outputting it all on port five. Uh, another one that we can do is a replication or what I call a replication uh, rule. And that's simply taking the traffic coming in a port and copying that traffic out to multiple egress ports. So that could be something as simple as all the traffic coming in port four. I want that to go out five and six and apply rule. And we'll see that we have that as well. Now you might notice as I've been typing in here, you'll get these red triangles, these red outlines popping up. The web GUI is really good at giving you feedback about what is a valid input for any given field here and what isn't. Uh, for example, if I try to say in port 10 on the CX2 where I only have six physical ports, it's gonna mark that as an error. I don't have the option to, to bring traffic in port 10, it doesn't exist. Uh, so this is gonna flag that, explain to me exactly why this is being flagged. And then furthermore, I won't be able to add this rule either way. Uh, so, that, so the web GUI will give you, uh, it will be interactive feedback on the values you put in as to whether they're valid or not. Going back to the rule table here, um, 
We'll just touch on these buttons over here real quick. So you can see that every one of these rules, I have three little buttons here. Uh, the red trash can is to delete that rule. Uh, I also have a button up here to delete all rules. The edit button here, this guy, allows me to select the rule and this allows me to change the action segment of a rule. When I edit a rule, I can't change anything with the main properties. Although just as a side note, you can see the cookie that was assigned to this rule whenever I created it is now displayed in that field. Um, I can't change any of the match fields, but I can change the action. So if I create a rule and I want to send that to a new port now rather than the old port it was on, or I wanna add some kind of header modification, maybe push a VLAN, I can hit the edit rule and come in here and make all those modifications and apply that. Uh, and then the copy rule button here just duplicates the rule. And now I can edit all of these fields. So I can um, edit anything regarding the main properties. I can edit the match fields. I can edit the actions just using this original rule as a template for I wanted to get started. And then I could create that rule. Now, um, so we have our unidirectional, we have our aggregation, we have our replication rules. We can combine these, of course. We can have a rule that both aggregates traffic and replicates it across multiple ports. I'm just gonna get rid of these rules here and clean this up a bit. So if we go back in here, we could do an aggregation slash replication rule and say all ports one through four, I wanna aggregate that traffic and I wanna output it on ports five and six. Create that rule. So now what we're doing is we are taking all of the traffic from ports one through four, we're combining it, we're aggregating it together, and we're sending out that combined traffic on both ports five and six. Five and six will each have a complete copy of that aggregated traffic. And another thing that we can do that would be really common if you have a packet broker in an inline scenario is creating a bi-directional uh, traffic flow rule. So if your packet broker is in line, you have a bi-directional link that you want to traverse the packet broker, but you know still have that bi-directional link actually work, um, you would need to create two rules to do that. So let's call the first one bi-directional one. And uh, let's say we want to create our bi-directional link across ports one and two. So our first rule is going to be in port one, out to port two. And then our second rule, bidirectional two, is going to be in port two, out to port one. So we end up with these two rules, and then anything that comes in port one goes out port two. Anything that comes in port two goes out port one, enabling bidirectional communication of traffic. Uh, what you don't want to do, a word, a word of caution here, what you don't want to do with these rules is you don't want to do something like in port one and two and then output to ports one and two because doing this, you will actually uh, create some bad situations potentially. So this is saying anything that comes in one and two is going to go out one and two. So anything that comes in two is going to be echoed back out two and then also out one and likewise with port one. So we don't want to set up bidirectional rules that way. But if we do have uh, our packet broker in line and we are setting up bidirectional rules, it would not be an uncommon scenario to actually want to have a copy of that traffic go out to a third port where we might have some kind of monitoring tool or security tool attached like an IPS, IDS, firewall, whatever. Um, so in that case, what we can do is do another bidirectional rule in port one, let's say we have our IPS hanging off of port five, and we want a copy of everything on this bi-directional link going out port five as well. So in port one, out to ports two and five, apply. And then the second part of this is going to be in port two, out to ports one and five. And thus we now have anything coming in port one, is going out two and copied to five. Anything coming in port two is going out one, copied to five. So we have our functional bidirectional link and then every every packet that crosses that bidirectional link or that bidirectional link is being copied out to port five as well. So these are the basics of just getting some traffic moving across your device. The common scenarios we see with network packet brokers, obviously, you know, this is, this is the very simple 
simple level of, of getting traffic moving. So in future videos, we're going to start moving down the list of, of the filtering commands, start building more complex rule sets. Um, you know, this is just our point of departure. And uh, the next video, I'll cover doing these same th the same scenario in this command line interface of the device, and then we'll take it from there. So until then, thanks for watching and take care, everyone.